Hello and welcome back to the edition podcast. I'm your host, as ever, Charlotte Henry. Um, normally I try and spread out appearances of my lovely guests, but sometimes I've got to haul them back in because something massive is happening. Uh, and that's why Sean McNulty has been grabbed back in. Hello, Sean. How are you? Uh, um, thanks for grabbing me. Nice to see you. It's great to see you. Now, the big, big news we have to discuss is the ongoing writer's strike that's affecting Hollywood, that's affecting, well, you can explain what it's affecting, but let's... Go back to the beginning. You've covered a lot of this over at The Ankler, but explain to my listeners who might not have been following it as closely as you guys at The Ankler what the writer's strike in America currently is. So the writers went on strike uh, essentially May 2nd, so we're over a month into the strike now, uh, recording here the first week of June. Um, And to be clear, we're talking about TV writers, movie writers, the people that write the stuff that we like to watch. Yes, screenwriters of all kinds. Uh, so anything TV or film related, and a few other you know extraneous things. But um, yes, so uh, you know uh, the the deal comes up every three years. Uh, every guild does. There's a DGA, which is directors, uh, SAG after, which is actors, and Writers Guild, which is WGA. Um, all three have deals coming up. The DGA, the directors, just struck a deal, so they uh, were you know they they've avoided going on strike. SAG after begins on June seventh for their negotiations their deals up june 30th so it's a three-week tight timeline there wga went on strike on may 2nd uh they are not currently negotiating with the studios those those negotiations broke off uh hence the strike that was about a month ago and um the uh, the studios which we are called the the, the organization that is called the amptp <laughs> <laughs> so good. that's like things like what Warner Brothers, Netflix, Warner Brothers, Universal, Netflix, Apple, Amazon, you know, so major streamers and uh, major studios in Hollywood. So they, they collectively negotiate as the AMPTP uh, and the AMPTP and the WGA are not speaking right now um, or not negotiating right now. And certainly the studios are focusing on SAG, as you know, as I said, to get that done. So the writer's strike will continue, you know, ostensibly continue for the near future until the SAG. Uh, situation either goes on strike or gets resolved the writers are generally striking for two things your, your initial question um one being just uh, i'll say more money um uh, there's a structural problem in television writing essentially f- versus feature writing it's really in the tv business where the where the pain is being felt and the issues are exist where the model has really shifted <laughs> i would say kind of toward the uk model where seasons are six eight ten episodes Mm. they're not the 13 to 22 that we used to do all the time in america which the uk has done as far as i know for decades yeah we kind of touched on that when you were last on the show actually didn't we that we were saying there's much longer seasons uh of your shows over there let's so there's a few issues because i've been following your coverage about what the spike is so uh, the strike is about so let's break it down a little bit the first thing we should clarify is the wga writers guild of america That's essentially the trade union of people who work in screenwriting. Correct. So that's where the collective bargaining is. As you say, the contract they have with the studios comes up every three years. And uh, it's fair to say quite a lot has changed in TV and film over the last three years and will continue to change over the coming three years. Hence, The the last one was negotiated in 2020, which was right in the middle of COVID. So there was no, uh, they essentially lost a bargaining window. So it's essentially, you're talking about six years. If you want to be real practical about the time, the time lapse here and six years (laughs) is even more of a, you know, a a time change in the business. If you want to, we've had about 25 new streaming services in that time. So, uh, yep. And probably some have folded in that time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The price has definitely gone up. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So, As I understand it, and you can correct me on all the things I get wrong, some of the (laughs) things that writers are concerned about are what you call small writers' rooms. So shows are created by writers, um, a team of writers in a room working together to come up with ideas. And my understanding is that studios have tried to cut down on the number of people in those writers' rooms. This obviously is not great for writers because it just limits the amount of things people can work on. That, as I understand it, is one issue. Another issue, as I understand it, is that um, the writers are sort of being held on the smaller series you talk about when there's less episodes, but they're still not being able to get go and do other jobs during the time. And of course, the other one that seems to be coming out is everyone's scared of AI. 
sure. Well, that's that's every industry, certainly. It's not endemic right. to the writers, but uh, it's certainly on the list, and the writers are the first – uh, you know, in terms of what's going to what's AI going to mm-hmm. replace writing is probably your first uh, uh, outside of, say, graphics or design. You know, actors are probably a little further off and an AI directed movie is probably no. even further off. So the writers are kind of front. They see themselves as front line and probably are correct in that assessment. Right. Exactly. So have I got those three things right? Are there things I've missed? Are those the things that are sort of concerning the writers right now? Yeah, and there's there's a in addition to the, to the what we call the mini rooms over here, the smaller writer rooms. Um, is that writers don't stay with the show for a season anymore? So you'll come to do a, a mini room and kind of we call break the scripts or you know break the story, essentially setting the plot lines for the episodes, and then uh, generally they'll be assigned to write and so on and so forth. But they're not staying on through production. Which, if you've ever been in TV production, what you write is not necessarily what ends up on the screen. <laughs> so you get on set and you're like, "This isn't working," you know. So you rewrite and you you, know, yeah. you learn how to what we call show run a show, be a showrunner yeah. here. And with these mini rooms, you're just in the writing process and you're not following the show through its production, just to the nature of what this the the nature of what mini rooms are. You're not, and again, you're not doing. 20 episodes a year, 13 episodes a year, where it's a, almost a year long cycle or maybe a 10 month cycle where it's a, essentially a full time job for a year where you're coming on maybe for two months, maybe three months for a mini room. And that's it. And the show goes off and shoots and the showrunner has to be as the, as the only person on the set. The showrunner is also a writer to address these on the set concerns where before they would have other writers on staff to help out. So that's kind of a tied into that mini room issue is not just the mini room itself, but also what it means for production at large because the writers still want to be involved through well, they to, need the to end. be i mean are you going to argue the quality is going to yeah. be better and that's also it's that the apprentice system uh charlotte of like that's how you learn yeah. to really deliver a show versus anybody can not anybody but you can write a script but can you make that script deliver into the product yeah. that you envision is a whole other set of you know b- yeah. ball, set of rules there and this issue of restriction on what else you can work on Right. So, look, just because you're ordering eight episodes instead of 13 doesn't mean it won't take as long to write them. Um, And that's one thing, too. So you're only (laughs) you're writing and and, and pay in TV, you know, it's generally by the week. And then also by episode, you get a fee for an episode. So the fewer episodes you order, the fewer fees out there and their material. They're, you know, thirty thousand dollars for a minimum or you know those kinds of things it's not like it's you know five thousand dollars or something like that it's it's a, a you know and that and also you get residuals for episodes that you write so that continues on down the chain so when there yeah. are fewer episodes being written your opportunity as a writer to make money is you know again you can see that the walls closing in on you here yeah. a little bit uh and that becomes a problem as well and, and but you can also not your you know if the it sees it's we call it series series one series two season one season two we call it in the states here you know you're have an obligation and a contract with that show to come back. And, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you're not getting paid what you were to work on that show to begin with, where before it was a 10 month gig, you'd make your yearly annual salary where now if you get a quote unquote, a job on a show writing, that may not cover your year um, from a financial point of view, especially and living the, in Los Angeles. Right. But it's equally, there might be limitations on what else you can do. So yes, right. show one might take you three to yep. six months to work on, but you're still restricted. You can't really go and yeah. work on show two. Because show one may come back for the next season and then you can't be working on another show, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So some issues there. Um, the AI issue, we can all understand if they're already trying to make writing rooms smaller and spend less money on the writers. You can imagine some clever top level studio exec going, why do we need humans to write this? Surely chat GPT can at least write some of it. And yeah, then and it's also kind of what's what material is based on, where right. if you had a free idea out there and you have something with, oh, can you turn this into a script? And, you know, so based on something that they got for free, which instead of paying the I don't know, six, seven figures to a, a book or a, a spec script or whatever, there's more that's probably that source material, I think, is the main point of concern. I think, uh, you know, and where AI can get to. It's like if you want, if you want to predict where AI is going to be, it's a three year deal, right? So where's AI going to be in 2026? You, you know, be my guest. So it's having some protections or as to where this might go, or at least some understandings that. Uh, you know, humans have to be involved and uh, the DGA did get some language in their deal saying, you know, things can only be directed by humans, not AI. And, you know, there's some protections in there existing. It's just a matter of uh, putting something in there now that quite frankly makes everybody feel better. I don't know. No no one's like, here's the exact proposal, but doing nothing feels like a 
bad move for the WGA right now. Yeah, it's acknowledging that there could be an issue in trying to at least remove as many loopholes as possible. Uh, loophole, exactly. Loopholes is a key word. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, and because that's one of the things that the WGA wants, the writers want, isn't it? That basically you can't replace any of the people in the room with AI. If the people in the room want to use some AI, well. Right, exactly. There's a two-sided coin there where it could be used as a, is AI a tool or is AI a replacement? And no, yeah. one, no one has answered to this question clearly. And no. AI will be a replacement for some jobs. You're already seeing that in copywriting in the US a lot. A lot of companies are, you know, dropping freelance copywriters sure. and things like that. They used to work, but if the job, that job can be done by a computer, it's like, okay, then the, WGA is not writing copy for ads. They're writing scripted materials, it's different, but the principle is certainly there to, to, to be examined. Yeah. And you've, of course, yeah, the argument, and I think it's a really strong one, is that however clever AI is now and may get in three, yeah. six years time, totally. you can't replace the creativity and humanity of uh, you know, real life humans. I mean, exactly. we were just slightly joking about the succession uh, finale before, mm. because of course we were. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> the idea that someone could have, like a AI large language model could have guided and come up with some of those one-liners is impossible to imagine. It is, but you know, you want to feed all the succession scripts into a bot and see what it comes up with. You might be surprised. I have no idea. Sure, you know, but it needed uh, a human first. Uh, yes, it did. And th that's exactly right. So, you know, how do you compensate that? It's not coming with, it's not being based on nothing. You fed the scripts in. It's based on it, it you yeah. know, in, in, among other things. So again, attribution is going to be another big issue in AI in terms of it's fine to do this stuff on your own. When you, but once you start making money from something, yeah, then it's like, um, no, you know, it's back to like sampling and music way back in the 80s, yeah. you know, where it's like, yeah, the, initially that was not that was not it was legal it wasn't regulated you know people were doing it and no one was getting paid for it and then the, the mid 80s were like yeah uh you got to pay us when you're using our uh, music beat in your songs and yeah. making money off of it you know so yeah i just can't imagine chat gpt coming up with the line hey buddha nice tom fords <laughs> it never seems to astound me but yes exactly i don't think uh Which I, we're not i think probably is still the great line from that show but i could probably dig up some others as well yeah. uh, little greglet and so on mm -hmm. um actually i mean max obviously succession street on max but let, let's talk about streaming because obviously that is one of the core core bones of contention isn't it in this negotiation not negotiation um because you mentioned residuals earlier and as again, correct me when I'm wrong, as I understand it, the writers, this is jet writers in jail. This is not just American WGA writers. This is writers around the world, TV writers around the world are basically getting paid less residuals by the streamers. It's limiting what they're earning. First of all, yeah. why is that? And then how is this playing out? Sure. The rates for residuals, you know, again, this is a business that was based on broadcast television, which has different rates than streaming. And there's, as you know, less broadcast television being made and more of it is, you know, going to streaming. So uh, the bigger thing, it seems to be foreign streaming. And also yeah, that counts you in the UK uh, in terms of the US. <laughs> yes. uh, but, and that the, the, the DGA, when they settled their deal, the, their, one of their main issues was increasing payments for foreign residuals, which they got a 76% increase essentially from the largest. Uh, so I watch Friends on Netflix here in the UK. Yep. Someone wants to get paid properly for it. Paid properly for it. And then the growth in, you know, Asia Pacific and all the, everywhere else in the world. And as you know, those services, charge different amounts in different parts sure. of the world. So the India subscription is much different than the UK subscription. And, you know, so it's not a one size fits all, but from, again, from that six, six years ago point, the business has gone far more global, far, you know, so that's a big catch up point of, yeah, we need to reflect that too, because before if a show sold internationally, it wouldn't be us streaming on the services. It would be, you know, if Warner Brothers produces friends that's owned by Warner Brothers television, they sell it to you know, Sky and the UK, Channel 4 in the UK. They sell it to here. And every time that sale happens, April. the writer gets a check. When it's just streamed on Max Global, that's a different business yeah. model that doesn't provide as much money in the current model. So they are trying to you know figure out what that new compensation might be um, to even yeah, out. Yeah, I'm doing my friend's viewing history now. It was Channel 4 when it was original. <laughs> then it went to E4 where it was just on constantly, obviously owned by Channel 4. And now it's on Comedy Central. Right. And it's on Netflix. So, and it's on sorry, Netflix. No, in the sorry, UK. on Max. Oh, so, no, it's actually not. Where is it on? Where's the stream? It's on Netflix UK? in the UK still. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so it's on Max here. Since you don't have Max, there you go. 
yeah for, uh, last time i checked it was still on a when you scroll through my netflix it's still there reminded me that i watched all of it um so yeah th- this is it's a hugely controversial issue really because it's not one of those things where you're like okay some writers are on strike i'm still watching my tv sort it out because uh, as didn't some of the nightly shows instantly go off air jimmy fallon they basically couldn't which are a huge part of American TV viewing culture, suddenly couldn't function anymore because there were no people writing each day. Well, the timing here is actually pretty bad for the writers. Um, The the late night night TV shows pretty much go off the air in the summertime and the strike happened pretty much end of the season. So you're correct and say, yes, there was no, there's no live, uh, there's no new late night TV show happening, but there wouldn't be normally. Um, okay. because in June they kind of go off the air there is, you know, Kimmel famously, you know, takes Jimmy Kimmel who does the ABC yeah. show here famously takes two months off. Now they have guest hosts come in. That's not going to happen. Um, so come July, maybe there's none of that, none of that going on, but, um, so right now no one's again, unless you know, you know, the American public doesn't really, you know, doesn't affect them per se. It's like, yeah, they're always in reruns. And what do you mean they're on strike? You know, they don't, they don't know it in that sense. So, so that's if it was in February or an election season or things like that, where now it's none of that's going on. So until the fall was when you're really kind of noticed that. And then right. you know, the timing here is key because summer is also the time of game shows and reruns and reality TV, which will continue for the next three months here in America. So the timing and the calendar timing of this strike is actually not in the favor of the writers as well. And obviously there are series and seasons that were already ready to go. And the same with movies that were stuff that was ready to go. You know, Spider-Man could still come out. Yeah. Movies are definitely something that, you know, they movies generally work on at least a year, if not 18 months to two years of a cycle. So you may feel that in later 2024 would be when you probably actually, you know, when the strike will be a distant memory. And, you know, and what's changed since not only 2017, but the last strike was, which was back in 2007, uh, 2008, uh, you know, the stockpile of material, these these streamers, especially the Netflixes and Apples and Amazons have ordered and shot a lot of stuff already. So, uh, you know, you can kind of, how long can you quote unquote ride it out is a lot further along because you're not reliant on a fall TV schedule, which 15 years ago, the fall TV schedule was the business. And now it's certainly an important part. And we'll, I wrote something about that today in, in the wake up over at the angler about mm-hmm. that, about you're going to have these studio Hollywood studios who still own TV networks here in the U S start to feel this pain of the strike a lot earlier than the Netflix's Amazon and Apple, which really uh, can go for quite some time here. Ostensibly, we'll see if it hits a they get a subscriber hit. And you have two companies of these of the three there, Amazon and Apple, where this isn't even a, a line item on their earnings report. Like if they mm-hmm. were to pull out of streaming or just go to sports only, like it's you know they don't even tell you how much they make, how much they spend on this stuff. Yeah. So two of the major players here, it's not even a you know a drop in no. the bucket for them. Uh, Apple TV Plus is still put out all of Ted Lasso. Like, there's a bunch of seasons. Well, do you know what I mean? Like, if people hadn't got to that show because there was a well, strike, people would have yep. noticed it. If, you know, some of the net- big Netflix series hadn't gone to air because the writers hadn't finished them, we would notice that. But that's just not happened. Yeah. Um, when do you think here in the UK and, you know, internationally more broadly, we're going to start to notice? some of the hit of this um international's tough uh honestly uh you know american products still uh, quote unquote dominates a lot of markets right. in, in a you know pure sense but local programming in every market is growing uh and they're investing in this all this stuff is not affected by this there's these writers you know the uk the writers are not on strike and really no it's is- about the only industry in the uk that hasn't had strike <laughs> exactly it's right they're out there throughout europe for that matter um, you know, and things like in major markets, uh, you know, India, Australia, you know, their local production can continue as it's been going. So, yes, you're not, you know, you're not going to get the new season. The new Stranger Things is probably a year and a half off, you know, things like that. But which which is important. I don't want to downplay yeah. it. But if you're not getting the next season of Abbott Elementary and you're in the country in the fall, I don't even know if the last season had even aired there yet. You know, there's the way that these things are staggered out sometimes, you know, uh, seasons that have aired here haven't even aired in other markets around the world. So, mm. you know, that's not going to be a, a, you know, a pain point. The thing is about these streamers and even the studios in general is that 
most of their money, even though the subscribers are, you know, spread out throughout the world, most of the money comes in through the US. Sure. So that's really where the the pain's gonna be felt. And even if yes, viewership will maintain in other markets, the threat to revenue hit, especially for this Hollywood studios who have a huge core TV advertising business as the core of their revenue up to, you know, uh, their piece on this a little while ago, but up to, you know, anywhere from 35 to 50% of their revenue still comes from their cable TV business, which will be affected by this to an extent. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and look here in the UK, like the late night shows, some of the late night shows do come to some of the sky channels, uh, obviously the streaming right. stuff we do see, you know, people might have to wait a bit longer for what Wednesday season two and things right. like that. Exactly. Yeah. That won't get, probably won't, you know, I mean, Tim Burton shooting Beetlejuice 2 there in, in the UK right now anyway. So it's never, you know, it wasn't even going to be a shot anytime soon either way. But but also, Ooh, you know... This is, to... Sorry, an interesting question comes to mind. If yeah. American writers are working in, say, the UK mm. on a show and they're members of the WGA, are they on strike even if they're not oh, yeah. in the US? It's not, ge- not geo-targeted now. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, just, it's an interesting <laughs> thought. They're working on a UK-based show, say. Right, and UK writers could be working on an American because their right. guild is not on strike. Uh, you know, so yes, that's where the and but they could, you know, in solidarity not work on it or things like that. Yeah. But you know, whether you're technically crossing a picket line is one thing. Um yeah. but then also you have, you know, look, Premier League's going on, sports is still going on, the NFL will be back. You know, the, this kind of the big ratings draws are not you know, on television these days, sports is you know increasingly yeah. a lot of it and that's not going anywhere. Yeah, well, the Premier League just finished a couple of weekends ago. Right. We got the Champions League final yep. uh, on Saturday. You listed show, but yeah, there'll obviously be the cricket. There's the Ashes over the summer, so there's stuff. But yep. yeah, it's, yep. it'll be interesting to watch if people in the UK notice it because one of the reasons I, re- I mean, there's lots of reasons I like to have you on, Sean. But one of them was that we just haven't. This hasn't been a story at mm-hmm. all where I am in the UK, but it has been a big issue i know in the u.s particularly obviously new york and los angeles for obvious reasons. yes i mean that's the question is how much is this getting outside of the we call it the bubble of uh new york yeah. and la where uh you know our, our, ostensibly the american public may have heard something seen something on tv about it in the evening news you know when it, when it first happened per se but from a material oh my god my tv has changed uh, you're not really going to see a lot of effects of that until things like SNL aren't back in the fall or thing. You know, my yeah. Blue Bloods isn't back on CBS. You don't start seeing the promos, you know, for the fall seasons coming yeah, in. Well, and it's all reality shows. So if my NCIS Hawaii season three is disrupted, <laughs> I'm going to be furious. Sean. Bad news for you. You have to go to Hawaii yourself to go uh, get your fill. So. I'll be furious. Yeah. Uh, let's also talk about how this ends because I think that's what a lot of people will want to know. Because you've said. Pointed out, it's a standoff now. No one's officially ne- negotiated with each other. Have to assume there's lines of communication as there always are with these things, but there's no two sets of negotiators in a smoke filled room getting something done. Right. Uh, I've seen your colleague, Richard Rushford, and this was uh, a few weeks ago now in his column. He was talking about maybe November, December, things getting bumped till then. Is that still a realistic timeline? Is that a pessimistic timeline? I know you wouldn't dare. Obviously, well, I did disagree I, with I, Richard. I did. Well, I disagreed. Well, no, of course not. I would never disagree with Richard. Not um, sure. uh, but I wrote about uh, this today myself in yeah. the wake up newsletter. So I kind of put it from a business point of view. So in my mind, people, as you said, people don't do stuff uh, called, you know, pain points. People don't do things unless they have to. Um, and there's two issues with the writers. Big picture. One is more revenue, which is those residuals we talked about and higher fees for episodes. And look, money things get negotiated out. You know, that stuff figures out. And then there's just a structural issue of writer's rooms, those mini rooms we've talked about, and, you know, kind of exclusivity of not being able to take other jobs if the seasons are shorter. These are structural underlying issues that have nothing to really do with money, but more to do with philosophy of how we make television, mm. which is what is going to be the real problem here. I mean, you could see if... In my mind, you know, if the SAG deal gets done, which, you know, they haven't really come out with their list of demands yet. AI is certainly on there in in a different way, but I don't know what that is. And then otherwise, it's probably, again, more money related in that sense. So maybe they'll come to an agreement. Yeah, that's what their residuals too. Exactly right. Exactly right. Same issues in those regards. Uh, So if that gets, you know, a deal made by end of end of June here, um, that leaves a couple more months of not a lot of pain because, again, the American public isn't feeling it, you know, so on and so forth. And uh, the companies will start to feel pain companies. I mean, I'm kind of really talking really about the, the Hollywood studios now, not the streamers, Apple, Amazon, and Netflix, as I say, 
really exist in a different business model. Yeah. Uh, but they're they're negotiating as one AMPTP is that's one one sure. unit. There's no so a could there be a split at some point if the Hollywood studios are really uh, their ad you know revenue goes in the toilet in the Q3 when they're all publicly traded companies and you know what is the Wall Street pain going to come in here? Which I think is what really is going to bring the AMPTP back to the table in a meaningful way to figure this out. Again, no one yeah. does anything until they have to. And when are they going to have to? My, I was it worth it. I kind of laid it out today in the wake up newsletter, yeah, but it's I'll like, it uh, you know, I, September would be kind of when I'd say they come back. So I would say pr- I'm pretty close to Richard. I would probably hesitate and say October. Um, the, all these public companies have earnings calls again in late October, early November. So I would be surprised if that is still ongoing by the time of those earnings calls, because delivering more bad news on that, they already have earnings calls this summer, which is going to happen in early August in which they'll have to. Yeah. For the July quarter. For the, for Q2. Exactly. Second quarter. Exactly. Have to project out revenue for. Q3 and essentially Q4. And if they're going to say, hey, our revenue is going down, no Wall Street, no Wall Street doesn't like to hear that. No. And And there's a point where investors go, actually, you need to sort this. We can't just have this rumbling on indefinitely. You're not a good investment stock right now. You you already already have those streaming losses and other stuff that's been, you know, uh, have secular issues going on. So that's kind of my guess would be probably somewhere September, October with the caveat. If the actors do go on strike for a meaningful amount of time, that changes a lot of this because that, you know, as I said, directors can write to, can direct without directors can direct without writers. They can't direct without actors. So, yeah. so it just puts a full stop on the whole business, which changes this whole, whole scenario. Yeah. I mean, there was this thing called the upfronts where people talk about, you know, the shows that are coming. That was all quite embarrassing for the studios in the context of the writer's strike. Um, the thing I I kind of want to end on actually though is are there some advantages to some of the studios, particularly the streamers? And I ask that slightly counterintuitively because we know some of the streamers have been wanting to clear content. Um, you know, Disney have taken a write off, haven't they? Of significant amounts of content, we've seen it in some other places as well. Uh, David Zaslov at Warner Brothers Discovery is very keen to, keen to clear off some stuff, as we discussed last time you were on the show. This kind of gives them an excuse, doesn't it, to have less content if people are not writing the stuff. Yeah, so to a small point, it suits them. Yes, in a short-term sense, you're right. And that's what, and again, goes back to this, hey, you know, like writers are out, you know, out and allows us to, A, potentially cancel some deals that we don't want to have anymore because you have certain clauses. It's very particular to individual contracts. This is, you know, sure. it's called force majeure, where at a certain point you can cancel a contract. Um, some of them, some contracts have don't have that in there. So it's not a carte blanche across the board here, but that allows you to save costs or maybe you made a big deal in the streaming boom that you don't want to pay for anymore that hasn't borne out and it allows you to hit the eject button and save some money. Right. You're also not in production any, as, as much anymore. If you're not in production, you're not spending as much money. Clearly that will eventually Although catch it's costing up to you. Them, isn't it? Some of it is costing them the days that production. Yeah. The strike. Yeah, so strikes, you know, they're picket lines that shut down days of production. Some productions have just hit pause entirely. So that's happened. But again, I mean, the, the, a day of production is estimated. The Hollywood Reporter estimated it, you know, about two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand American dollars per shutdown day, which is not nothing. Um, but it's not, you know, it's a cost, but it's not, you know, it is what it is. And then that's why you see production shutting down in total because if you if those start to mount, they take the hint and say, "All right, we're, we're going to call this." You know, we're not going to get get anywhere on this. So. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, short term, but that stops the production. So then you're not spending money anymore as a studio. So like, oh, we have more money here, which short term is fine, but long term, you're lacking products if you don't have. And these, you know, studios all have product TV production arms, which sell to a variety of people, mm-hmm. as they're paid when they deliver episodes. If they're not delivering episodes, they're not being paid. Yeah. So your revenue from Warner Brothers Television, from Disney TV, from you know Universal, you know Universal Television, that is a decent size of their part of their revenue that will not be there in the report. Again, it's not a loss, but you're who wants to see revenue going down? Nobody. So uh, well, not Wall Street. Yeah, exactly right. Which brings so, us back to your your point of what brings kind me back of to, that's where I think this will probably net out to. not any other altruistic or strike shutdown days, which, you know, you have to pull all the leverage you got. Like, you know, it's a striking force. You have, you can only do so much. 
Yeah. One is not right, and one is to stop work as it is, as much as you mm-hmm. can. And they're doing that, but the real pain isn't felt until the Wall Street wisens up. And let's face it, all these top executives, most of their compensation now is in stock options, not in cash. So they feel the pain more when the stock goes yeah. down too. So, you know. Um, and is there public or industry support for the writers? Just as we're talking about all this, it, you know, I was going to say strikes me, but um, it, it occurs to me that a lot of strikes of all kinds depend on public support. Sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's great. You know, I mean, uh, President Obama has come out and said things, you know, <laughs> uh, you know like, sure, it's not. It's a popular... you mean, sorry, is that President Barack Obama with his massive Netflix deal? Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, he has, he had a Netflix show that just dropped. So yes, mm-hmm. he was out doing some press. So he was asked about this and, you know, uh, mm-hmm. gave a, a general statement of support. And look, most executives are, you know, they get it. Uh, there, uh, we wrote a piece last week at the, uh, the, the Ankler, Peter Kiefer and Nicole Laporte did about, look, these people are, you know, they're in the same schools as these people. They're, you know, it's not like these executives and writers exist in different worlds. Um, it's, and they're, and no one, and look at, you know, Hollywood executives, Disney just finished 7,000 layoffs. Uh, Warner Brothers is going to lay off more people this summer. So it's not like it's peachy keen to be an executive in the, in the media business, uh, these days either. So, uh, you know, that's it gets to be a little bit of a gray area there in terms of, the, in terms of that down, down the road for sure. Well, this has all been fascinating. I'm so grateful for you uh, laying this all out for my audience. Where can people keep up with you and your ongoing coverage of this, Sean? Yes, so you can subscribe. I do the Wake Up Newsletter, daily newsletter, Monday to Friday uh, at The Ankler. You can subscribe at theankler.com. Uh, we also have a free or the, the Ankler has a free uh, strike newsletter called Strike Geist. That's Strike, S T R I K E, Geist, G E I S T, strikegeist.com, free of charge. And that uh, our Elaine Lowe, who does a great job, she does a daily evening roundup of all the latest and greatest from the strike world uh, negotiations, executive suites, what's going on on the front lines, what shows are being shut down, all that news, and totally free at strikegeist.com. All worth keeping an eye on. I'm at Charlotte A. Henry on Twitter and basically. Anywhere across social media, you can find me as at Charlotte A. Henry or at Char A. Henry. Uh, Do head over to theedition.net. You can subscribe to the newsletter there. You can read blog posts there. You can see all sorts of stuff from the edition. So I hope you'll join me there. Sean, thanks once again for joining me. And I'll see you all next week. (laughs) 